Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode, I guess we're up to 853 now, George. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is April 30th, 2024. All right, well, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. This is where George and Kevin, we go to our happy place. First, I don't know why, but we're news freaks. We like to, to read the news and tell people about the news and kind of decide what the heck is going on out there in the world. And this is what you sit down and listen to, what the heck's going on in the world. We're glad you could join us. Um, before we get too far into the show, it's I'm so close to 10,000 subscribers. You could you could just see it at the top of the hill. We're at 9,600 and so many subscribers. So if you've not subscribed to the show, and there's many of you who have not, 28%, I don't mean to point fingers, if you could click the subscribe button and click that bell that pops up right after that, you'll be instantly notified every time there's a new episode of Anglican Unscripted or whatever else I cover around the world. It's helpful for you and for me that you're subscribed. And if you want to like the show on Facebook and YouTube, that fools the algorithm algorithm and tells them it's a good show and that they should promote it and it's free advertising for george and i george how are you doing this week miserable it's <laughs> been a tough weekend uh, i've had a family crisis necessitated my wife flying out west she may have to stay out there for a few weeks maybe a month or longer Two people die over the weekend at the church and it's just uh one of our uh, a number of viewers have uh, criticized me because I will smile when talking about horrible things. Uh, they say, "Oh, you must be taking wicked delight in these delight, things." Yeah. Um, and no, the answer is not that. It's just that you know when these bad things happen. And for long-term viewers of our show, you've you've walked with us through difficult times, sure. uh, illnesses and deaths and family and whatnot. There is a peace when you trust in the Lord and just don't uh, don't let him move out of the center of your being. Mm -hmm. So I can talk about, you know, wars and famine and conflict and evil and sickness and death. And I can still be at peace. But even at a personal level, OK, at 10 o'clock today, uh, Jill and I got very devastating uh, news, but I'm still here to report because I need to be anxious and nothing. And I really take that to heart. You know, mm -hmm. um, I remember the days when I was anxious, like watching uh, Gulf War One on CNN. I'm just like, oh, just fearful and anxious and, and all that build up. Or I remember what it was like to be anxious and not take to heart, you know, that God is in control. That at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, he is in control. And any time that I'm anxious, it's because... I don't believe he's in control. Mm -hmm. And that's me taking over that. And I, I believe fully that God is in control. I may not like or feel comfortable what happens, but I like who's doing it. I, I follow you know, on to death the, uh, the God and uh, the Trinity who I've, I've chosen to follow. And I, I don't have to see any reason after all my years of experience to change that now. Um, Boom. Yeah, that's the way it is. Let's move on, George, to the news. Uh, I'm keeping on a different page here. Here we go. So news is out there. We talked about the primates going to Rome. It was the headline of last week's show. And a group photo of the event shows that 30 primates out of the 42 uh, are, are there. And they get to do some special things, meet the Pope, you know, they probably get a free rosary, uh, that type of thing. Um, but good to see that the, uh, the primates are having a meeting, George. Yeah, and it's, uh, well, there's been a lot of speculation in the church press about this as a make or break meeting. Uh, one phrase was high stakes poker is being played. And I have to tell you, friends, it's not, that's not happening. This is being billed as a pilgrimage and a time of prayer for the primates who are there. There are about 41, 42 primates. I think one or two offices are vacant. Uh, 10, 11, 12 people are missing. 
Michael Curry's sick, but he has a substitute there. Um, the GAFCON primates are not there. The Global South primates, some are, some aren't. And so about a quarter have stayed away. And this is about this portion that have stayed away for the past few year, few meetings. So that there's no breakthrough, there's no gain of people, there's no loss of people. There's seven new boys uh, who don't know, and basically they don't know anything about anything about how these things work. <laughs> Which one's and, Justin? Which one's Justin? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and but you know, for it's exciting because you know they're going to Rome, they're going to meet the Pope. This is a junket. And is anything substantive going to come out of this? Well, there have been reports that the Inter Anglican UFO Commission, Unity, Faith, and Order. Unfortunately, named UFO Commission. No, I think it's properly uh, named. <laughs> is going to present a first draft of their plans for the reorganizing of the instruments of the Anglican world. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's been the push by the Global South to remove Canterbury from the from the center of the circle, and it's agreed that perhaps we need to change the way things are done. And but they're pushing like a six to eight year bureaucratic, uh, you know process um that's not acceptable to the global south or gafcon but so it's going to be under discussion but basically i have very low expectations other than that i hope the fellows have a great time on their vacation but there's not going to be any true i hope i'm surprised no I, but there's not going to be some breakthrough of uh, of any sort they tried that. They tried to have meetings. They tried to hold uh, other provinces accountable. Jill, George, I called you my wife's name, George. <laughs> We're practically married. Uh, and so they, it, they tried that over the last 12 years. It didn't work. It didn't work, not because they didn't try, but because the Archbishop of Canterbury thwarted the process. He you know, basically sunk that ship. They agreed in London when they had a primate's gathering that they're going to hold the Episcopal Church accountable for three years. And Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, said, you guys don't worry about enforcing that. I'll take care of it. Months later, we see Michael Curry uh, officiating the wedding of Harry and Meghan, uh, talking to us about love, true love. It was one of those type of weddings. And in a such, you're like, wait a minute. So we've been hooked right here. You know, this this uh, Justin fellow lies. Not only does he, you know, not hold people accountable, he will lie and tell you he will. And so, in, in as such, I don't think we can have another honest primates meeting with this primus, George. Also, even before with Rowan Williams, there was the meeting in Tanzania where Rowan Williams was charged by the primates to go to the Episcopal General Convention and tell them off, don't do the gay stuff anymore. You got to stop. Yeah. And Rowan Williams uh, punted. He, you know, he flew he, to New Orleans. He, he, he flew to New Orleans. Yeah. He went there and he got talked out of it. Wasn't very hard to talk him out of. <laughs> no. But so the... Uh, these expectations of great clashes of wills and whatnot... This is not this is not how the primates medic work. They're bureaucratically controlled junkets where the yeah. agenda is written ahead of time and the closing statement is read, written ahead of time. Yeah. So we really shouldn't expect anything profound. Now, I'm hopeful, hoping that the Global South meeting in June outside of Cairo will take a different course. But are we still... I, I, I don't really have a sense yet of whether there's momentum on the Global South side, but there certainly is inertia and stasis on the Whaleby side. And I think, uh, yeah, well, here, Justin Welby is trying to get the band back together, but he brings them in castrated. We're bringing the band back together. You can be primates, but don't bring your instruments. Don't be who mm -hmm. primates are. Don't be teachers of the, of the church. Don't be leaders of the church. We're just gonna get together and we're gonna go meet the Pope and have some tea, and here's your free rosaries. Yeah. And, and, and also, these meetings really, um, they're, they're not proper. For instance, Justin Welby always has been inviting Stephen Cottrell, the Archbishop of York, to come to these meetings to be a primate. 
well, he's the primate of England, while Justin Welby's the primate of all England. Well, if that's the case, then why don't we have the Archbishop of Dublin and the yes. Archbishop of Vermont, the primate of Ireland and the primate of all Ireland? Or why don't we have five Nigerian archbishops uh, or the five Canadian provincial archbishops? But yeah. instead, Justin Welby gets to add a buddy with the same voice and vote and authority as the leader of a very large church whose England gets two votes, for instance. Or loyalty is rewarded. The Archbishop of Mexico, who was deposed by the Mexican General Synod, whom a court, civil court, has upheld the validity of that deposition, and it's gone through the appeals process, and it's been fully adjudicated. The guy's out. Archbishop Trevino is no longer the Archbishop of Mexico. He still has an invitation from Justin Welby because he is a loyalist. He is a brown face that will say good things about Welby and the English system. Now, that's very cynical on my part, but, you know, this is how it's working. Let's work that way for a long time, and we'll talk more about archbishops and their past decisions as we get further into our stories. Let me move on to our next story. I'm glad they could get together in Rome, and I hope that uh, God can be glorified in that, not just with a picture. Okay, you sent me the, the, the notes again today. Uh, notes number two is watch conference held at St. John's Waterloo in London on April 20th. And, yep, you know, here's where I, I get to talk about uh, Archbishop George Carey. But we'll do that when we get through the story. What's the story, George? Well, there was a, a, a gathering of batshit crazy women. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, every every group in the world has their extremists, you know. Uh, women in the Church, <laughs> WATCH is the acronym, is yeah. a lobbying group that wants to promote women clergy. And they had their main speaker was Rose Hudson Wilkin, who is the Bishop of Dover, who's a bit of a character um, and a bit of an extremist. Yes. And the uh, Rose Hudson Wilkin basically said, OK, it's been 10 years since the five guiding principles of the Church of England were adopted, which is the mutual flourishing. Live and let live. Mm -hmm. She says it's time to end that. Yeah. It's time to mandate uh, that Wait, all. Wait, did she use the word? Did she, did she use the word man? Date? Oh, oh, she's you maybe. Didn't say, <laughs> you didn't say mandate. Okay, it's time to require <laughs> that all clergy accept the ministry of women priests and bishops <sighs> to junk the five guiding principles, that there be no allowance to do what the Church of Sweden did. The yeah. Church of Sweden went through a process of first permitting women priests, then mandating women priests, and now if you don't believe in women clergy or gay clergy, you cannot even be ordained. The, the Watch it wants the Church of England to follow that path to move from what was optional to what is mandatory. Right? And to me, this sort of speaks of weakness, to be frank. Since 2014, the, the, the Church of England's blob, the hierarchy, has managed to keep out all uh, conservative new bishops, one or two exceptions, uh, but certainly no new conservative evangelical bishops. Philip North became bishop after having been a suffragan or an area bishop. But he went through such blood pain and bloodletting that, you know, yeah. I don't think people are going to put themselves up for it again. So they've so the, the watch group and their allies have been able to cull conservative bishops. They've not been able to do it with conservative clergy. Conservative clergy, by and large, are doing well. We've not had a mass defection yet. We've had some people leave, but they're still there. And those people are an offense to the Rose Hudson Wilkin group partially because many of them are very successful in their ministries. The churches, we, you know, there's all the statistics we've reported on the past, the churches that have women, I'm sorry, that have children in them yes. are conservative evangelical. The churches that are growing and all this and that. Whereas the watch constituency is dying um, 
on the is die is not able to reproduce itself and watch is out of weakness i think is now demanding action rather than seeking to persuade the gamaliel test they've failed and so now they want to compel uh adherence to their worldview short history uh who was the archbishop of canterbury who first voted for women clergy in the Church of England, George. Oh, that was George Kerr. I, I, he's still out there. He's still healthy. He can still write a little blog and opinion or do an interview with uh, uh, Anglican Scripted. I would be interested in his opinion of this. Uh, I would even, Justin Welby, who said we can have uh, women bishops. W what's your opinion on this? Yeah, I thought mutual flourishing was something that would be mutual beneficial to both sides of an issue. We are now to the point where we can only have one issue, and one issue only, we can have the unbiblical issue. So, okay. Yeah. I haven't spoken to George Carey lately, mm -hmm. but I do know that George Carey does believe in women's orders, but he also believes in mutual flourishing. He believes in the setup that they had 30 years ago, that you can permit this, this is a second order issue, mm -hmm. but you should not mandate one or the other. Justin Welby is famous or infamous for speaking to groups and l telling them what they want to hear. So when he speaks to gay activists outside of the palace, the gates of Lambeth Palace, he'll say one thing and he'll say another thing to the primates at the primates meeting. So Welby has been caught out in being two-faced so often that, uh, uh, well, yeah, I'll leave it there. That's a good place to leave it. All right, so we cover all that, and maybe we can hear from uh, Archbishop, now, former question, Archbishop. I think, again, yeah, I, I think your question is: Was George Carey naive in thinking that an accommodation could be reached? Well, if the accommodation was just with people of his generation, if you will, World War II and sure. you know, after generation. There was still a residual degree of toleration and respect for different opinions. But the polarization of the last 20, 30 years has basically rendered that absent. You know, it, look at the way our own governments operate. Used to be uh, a little more bipartisanship, but now that's just uh, a thing of the past. Yeah, I don't know if they had respect for each other, but at the end of the day, they could eat together uh, mm -hmm. in, in politics. You know, Roland Williams and uh, Ronald Reagan and uh, Tip O'Neill were a, a good example. You know, they hated each other's politics, but at the end of the day, they could have a cup of tea and, and have a steak together. And th those days are over, you know. So let's move on to story number three. The Church of England announces a plan to pay compensation and damages to sexual abuse victims. Uh, the payouts, surprisingly, are going to range from 5,000 pounds to 660 pounds based on length of time of abuse. I'm not understanding this, George. We have taken well. the ability of the church to apologize and to ask for forgiveness and to have these people um, participate in that to you're now a mathematical equation let's pay you out the uh put out a the, the church of england has put out a four-stage redress scheme that has payout on the low end of five thousand to the high end of six hundred and sixty thousand pounds and they're basically going to be a formula for determining where one falls on this four late four stage level of you know degree of abuse length of abuse so on and so forth i mean um it's not unreasonable it's sort of an insurance insurance mindset you know paying you know if, if you have an industrial accident you get more if you lose an arm than if you lose a hand sort of thing so it's a positive step forward that they're starting now to put their money where their mouth is. I mean, you could say that, well, they can come up with a hundred million pounds for imaginary reparations, but, and so, but now they'll come up with 5,000 pounds for a child who was raped by a priest. But what they've not come up with is any structural changes 
to ensure that there's accountability for the leaders who covered up or ignored or demonized those who reported victimization. But as yeah, we reported, the, those people are currently, well be- yeah, the, those people are currently in charge. Mm-hmm. So they, so it's a good step because compensation for damages is a just thing. Um, to be perfectly honest, from an American perspective, five thousand to six hundred sixty thousand is peanuts. Yeah. Um, well, let's do the math conversion here. If fifty thousand, that's sixty-two thousand U.S. dollars. So uh, mm-hmm. five thousand would be six thousand two hundred dollars. That's not very much if I were abused by a priest. That's. But you know, England has a le- ha- doesn't have the legal system we have here, and uh, damages and this and that. Um, so, but they they're willing to throw money into a problem, but they're not willing to put themselves or their souls or their or the truth into the problem. Yeah. I, I, was, yeah. I was trying to mention that how many years it's been since Justin Welby promised to meet with the the John Smythe or the victims, or how much cover-up do we have with the Fletch, Jonathan Fletcher business and so on and so forth. Yeah, and and they've asked to meet with him, and he said he would meet with them. It just never occurs. It's something that just, you know, if we, we could have like a running calendar, how many days since Justin Welby said he would meet with the victims? And we're up to what, at least 800 days, 900 days? You know, it just, the, and the clock keeps ticking. You know, if not more. You know, where Johnson Tamu is disciplined when he's retired as Archbishop of York, he loses his license to officiate in the Diocese of Newcastle in the north because he was he had knowledge but took no action on abuse, whereas the bishop who actually didn't do anything and who was the, the front-line bishop, uh, uh, Croft, Stephen Croft of Oxford, who is now of Oxford, is, is left untouched. Um, Stephen Cottrell, when he was Bishop of Reading, was involved in some of this stuff. And, of course, it doesn't stick to him because he's still in office. He's still a person of consequence. But, you know, they can beat up on dead people. They can beat up on retired people. George Bell, George Carey, uh, Johnson Tomu. But they will not. But those who are actually responsible will not stand and take the justice to be met out to them. Yeah. All right, so our next story. I'm gonna I'm gonna let people guess the location of the story, but how many we got? Forty provinces in uh, forty one, forty two. I yeah. I, well, counting the ACNA, we're forty two. So we have forty two provinces out there. One province has such bad, and this may give it away, corruption, that the court has appointed a trustee to oversee all the accounts of this province. And I think this is kind of the first time I've ever heard of this happening, you know, in a, a communion province-wide uh, church. And it makes news in the middle of our story structure because it's so important. Because of people who want to have relationships with uh, this type of uh, province because they would have access to such a large proportion of future Christians, George. Who am I talking about? Oh, Church of South India. Oh, my. Uh, a high court in Madras, or Chennai, has uh, placed the assets of the Church of South India under the control of a court-appointed trustee or receiver because the corruption of the leadership, the bishops and the uh, elected leaders, is so bad that they have been basically pillaging the assets of the Church of South India. And a number of lay groups have filed lawsuits trying to get it cleaned up. And every time they clean up this little diocese, then this happens in this next little diocese. Now, not every bishop is dirty, but the, but the majority are. At one time, a majority of the bishops were under criminal investigation. The, the primate uh, is under criminal investigation for fraud. The Church of North India, different church, same country, is in jail right now for fraud. Uh, and he's been defrocked and deposed. And the courts in India have basically said, look, you guys cannot be trusted with your property because we've had too many bishops and too many uh, 
diocesan executive committee selling off church assets at fire sale prices to developers from whom they get kickbacks. So it's, you know, corruption is such a major problem in the Indian church that, uh, you know, what can one say? And what, what can one do? I mean, as a Anglican communion, how can we help restructure and reformulate and hold accountable uh, those instead of having them show up for pictures and stuff as we have junkets around the world? I'm just trying to think it outside the box here, George. Well, at the end of the day, to be perfectly honest, the whole corruption is more of an issue in Tanzania and in uh, some of the African diet provinces, uh, in Zimbabwe, for instance, um, in, and in India and other places, South America, Mexico. Well, that, um, that, that's because corruption still is led at the state level. In yeah. India, they're trying to correct the uh, corruption, and the corruption here is at the church level. At, but, you know, like in Mexico, the corruption, uh, the government's corrupt, and the church has an opportunity to stand for truth and mm -hmm. for the people. But instead, the system there has been that a number of not all the Mexican bishops, far from it. Some have led the drive against corruption. That's why the primate Trevino was uh, kicked out. But if the, the Anglican Communion's leaders, if they paid attention to corruption as an issue of importance rather than putting gay stuff front and center on every issue i think it would do more for the daily life of so many of the christians in this world if they focused on corruption and bad government both in the church and in the world than on uh you know our next story is about the latest insanity of the episcopal church uh you know th that being the issue yeah. uh, well We've, I've spoken often that the church has lost the benefit of the doubt. And this is one of the reasons. You won't hold your own people accountable. You won't hold your bishops and clergy accountable. We can see the corruption. We can see how uh, a priest uh, becomes ordained and uh, gains a parish one day, and a year later he's driving a Land, a land Rover. We see that corruption. And you guys won't do anything about it. And why would we trust you? And it's true. Why are we focusing on the gay issue when the corruption issue is a thousand times more hurtful to the church? A million times more hurtful. So, you know, good point there, George. Let's move on to our next story here. It, the, the situation in India is such that clergy pay other clergy to allow to be for their votes at synods yeah. so that they can become bishop with the expectation that they can recoup their investment out of the coffers of the diocese and out of the, out of the Christians in the diocese. That's how bad it is in India. And that happens in India and in Africa. It's uh, not mutually exclusive to any one place there. Uh, Rico Tice leaves the Church of England, kind of. He is a John Stott protege. He spent 28 years at All Souls Langdon Place. And he's been the author of Christianity Explored course. And he was last year's speaker at GAFCON in Kigali. And to me, it's kind of just like another guy who go, wait, what? There's corruption? How dare there be gambling here in, in Casablanca? It's like <laughs> you, you, you kind of woke up to it when it's been going on all around. And I take this to people who are optimists like myself and pessimists. When I see a, a situation like the Church of England, I see opportunity. If we can just shine the light bright enough, they will come to their senses. And guess what? That doesn't always happen. In fact, in the Church of England, it seldom happens. And that seldom happened to Rico Dice, George. Well, in a successful church, and if you sit at the feet of John Stott, yeah. and if you're involved in successful ministries, you can get the impression that, you know, yeah, it may be bad down the street, but God is doing great things. Mm -hmm. Rico uh, Rico gave an interview with Evangelicals Now where he admitted to being naive about the state of affairs in the Church of England, thinking that the success that he experienced and the fellowship and the Christian 
enthusiasm that was in, so infectious in so much of his ministry and life was shared by other people. And that, you know, when the Archbishop of Canterbury asked him to be on a commission to help evangelize England, he meant it rather than just, you know, oh, well, we need somebody from column A and somebody from column B. Well, Weaker retired after 28 years at All Souls Langham Place. He still works and manages Christianity Explored, which is uh, akin to the Alpha program. Mm -hmm. It's a, a small group, a leadership course. But he told evangelicals now that he's now worshiping at an independent Presbyterian church because he cannot stomach the apostasy of the leadership of the Church of England. Now, this is a big deal because, you know, John Stott was famous with his debates for J.I. Packer in the 60s and 70s of do we stay in and work from within to reform it or do we break out and uh, and uh, you know go our own way yeah where, where Packer, can the, the, both of, where can we do the most good inside or outside yeah pack Stott and Packer to a lesser extent basically said stay content well here is one of Stott's great acolytes who basically said staying and contending isn't worth it anymore which is quite quite a quite a statement indeed all right uh so well but hold on you have you know see he's keeping his uh license to officiate why would he do that yeah we had an anglican ink story uh by julian mann where even though he's worshiping at a presbyterian church and has left the church of england he's still keeping his license from the diocese of london the pto permission to officiate mm -hmm which will allow him to be a guest preacher and celebrant at London diocesan churches. So the question is, is he all the way in or all the way out? Or is he half in, half out? Uh, or is he out this Sunday, but in next Sunday? And the Diocese of London has decided not to answer that question. And Rico Tice hasn't either. Huh? Well, let's just hope he's not guilty by association like George Carey and loses his license like the uh, former archbishop did for a time all right let's move on to some of the last stories we have here the Neshota house a famous very famous seminary in wisconsin has appointed a new dean laura Whitna. i'm sorry if i'm not pronouncing that uh, correctly now in the history of Neshota house i don't remember them having a female dean not a big deal I do not remember them having a lay person as dean. And I thought, hey, well, let's talk about stuff here, George. First of all, congratulations. Yeah, I know nothing about her. No. I don't know nothing about her. I looked at her resume and uh, mm -hmm. you know, didn't really tell me much of anything. Um, and I'm just wondering, what was the board of Neshota House looking for? Were they looking to have somebody who could be acceptable both to the Episcopal Church and the ACNA? Were they looking, or were they looking to basically to move in one direction, to be fully in the Episcopal world or fully in the ACNA world? I can't tell. Well, that was a good tell. question. I, uh, just looking back at recent history, um, as far as my history, uh, Robert Monday was the uh, uh, dean there for a while. Then he was let go, uh, and they replaced him with a bishop, a former bishop of South Carolina, uh, to be an interim dean there. Um, I mean, it, it shows that the, you know it's clearly Monday was pure ACNA or uh, pro ACNA, and uh, uh, the bishop. I'm, I'm, why is it Ed my, Salmon? Ed Salmon, Ed Salmon. Uh, was pro tech. Are they just going back and forth, or? Well, Woody Garfield, uh, who stepped down as dean, he's still going to be there as a professor. Mm -hmm. um, he was able to sort of thread the needle and he be did both a good job. Yeah, tech and ACNA, mm -hmm. and probably the stress of doing that was something that you know he wasn't worth the grief. So. Is this young woman, and she's in her late 30s, early 40s, is she going to be up to it? It's uh, it's an interesting choice. It is. Well, you and I love uh, Nichodas. We did a one-day course there a year or two ago, and that was a lot of fun. So uh, we we pray for the, the seminaries that they bring up 
uh, um, righteous young leaders for the Episcopal Church and for the ACNA and for uh, denominations around the world, Lutherans included. So we shall see what happens there. But congratulations and Godspeed to, to Lauren. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, a lot of our audience doesn't know what DEI is, George. Uh, some people said they'd look it up. DEI is what? Diversity, equity, inclusion. Yes. That's the moniker for the uh, current wokeness fad of, uh, of affirmative action and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you your company has gone woke and you understand that all white men are bad or potentially bad, you... Uh, want to make amends to that and you hire a DEI officer who can help guide the way with hiring people and training people and training them to know what is good and bad in a new light. Not, you know, not with, with scripture or morality, but in light of wokeness um, and, and how these people can advance themselves over other people based on their minority status. And uh, it looks like Tech hired a gender staff officer. I will put their picture here for you so you can uh, see uh, uh, their their higher picture. And George, without us getting sued, anything you want to say, you used with the word allegedly in front of. Uh, what's your thoughts? <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> it just goes to show the priorities of the Episcopal Church's leadership. Um, money is very tight. We have okay. diocese amalgamating, uh, okay. diocese unable to afford bishops, diocese of New Jersey asking for a $200,000 cut in their payout okay. for this year because of uh, problems with their accounting. Yet money can be found to hire somebody to try to, to in, um, support gay and lesbian ministries in the Episcopal Church. I mean, it's always, it's a caricature and the, the fellow, I'm sure he's good at his job. He is a graduate of Union Theological Seminary and has had a bunch of committee type jobs that actually don't deal with sort of normal parishioner life, but, you know, have been focused on specific niche markets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just the ridiculousness of how they spend their money. It's like the Church of England Diocese of, what was it, Bradford? spending all this money to hire a uh, somebody to combat whiteness when in the north of England's a pretty white place and you know the episcopal church we need to get more gay people which gay people are left to be gotten by the episcopal church <laughs> i mean come on now you got them all well i'm going to include a little story here that's related to this and um there's a uh, a uh, little trek trek track event happening in west virginia uh, that involved uh, some middle school girls and uh, one uh, gendered girl, transgender girl, trans man, a boy who thought he was a girl. And the girls decided, hey, you know, um, he's throwing three feet farther than us. We're not going to compete against this uh, man who's pretending to be a girl. And so we're walking away from the competition. And the school board and now the state has decided that these girls are no longer allowed to compete at any level in the state uh, for for not being forced to play with this boy. And that's just the new normal here. What, 120 years of feminism has just been blown out of the water completely by transgenderism. You know, women have no rights. Little girls have no rights. They, they don't have the right not to say no to this this athletic rape. You have to accept it. Men will always be better, and now you know. And there's nothing you can do about it. Except in Florida. Oh, yeah. The governor, <laughs> well, the governor has said that these Title IX regulations put yeah. down by the Biden administration, which interprets women under the Title IX Department of Education rules yeah. to include people who think they're women, but biologically are men, uh, Florida will not uh, allow that or enforce that or permit yeah. that in its school systems. So yeah. the states can, if they so choose, push back. Um, 
Well, I think you and I and Christians and people of reason need to really start pushing back. This is gender appropriation. This gender has been stolen. The person using it did not do anything to earn it. They uh, are not the gender they claim to be. And they are hurting other people of that gender. They're, they're raping the gender that they, they're, they're saying they are. Because now they're, they're forcing women to play with men. And that's, that's, the, that's the new rape. Because the girls are not allowed to say no. You know? It's crazy. Oh. I know. Oh, my is right. <laughs> okay, let's move on to uh, our last story. New Bishop for English Ordinariate. Uh, well, this is interesting. Uh, David Waller, 62, served as the Ch uh, Church of England priest for 20 years and was a member of the General Synod before becoming a Catholic priest in 2011. He's the new lead, George. Yes, uh, the Ordinariate uh, led by Monsignor Keith Newton uh, has 15, 20 years, yeah. and Newton's married, and so even though he's a bishop in the Church of England, he could not be a Catholic bishop because he has a wife. And that was the same with Jeffrey Steens in the United States. Um, and so these men, as leaders of the ordinariates in England and the uh, U.S., Canada, were uh, given the rank of Monsignor and ap apostolic visitors for the diocese. They held the authority of a bishop, but they weren't given the title of the bishop. Waller's unmarried, and because of that, he will be ordained a bishop and will be the first ordained priest ordained to the episcopate uh, by the ordinariate in, in this uh, current system. Um, so the, the, the ordinariate uh, is chugging along. It's not been the success that its founders had hoped, but it is not withered up and drunk gone away. Hmm. All right, that's the last of our stories, George. George and I now have to leave the program and go handle the ang the stuff that we're not anxious about uh, that's out in the world. Uh, keep us in your prayers because uh, not only is uh, anchors and co-host of the show, uh, it puts us in the spotlight where Satan loves to uh, attack us through our families. And there's nothing that will get Kevin more uh, off the beaten path than having to deal with a child or a family emergency. Same with George. We love our families. And if you could spend today just a couple minutes at the end of the show here, uh, just praying for us and lifting us up and lifting us up the, the ministry of Anglican Unscripted, we would greatly appreciate that because we want to be here for you tomorrow and for many years to come. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 853 of Anglican Unscripted.